Thank you, Minnie. And I just wanted to uh, note that we are live streaming this on Facebook as well. So we're very happy to be here. And um, Minnie mentioned that um, I'm here with some members of my team. Um, I'm Jeanette Hughes, and I'm a Canada Research Chair at the Faculty of Education um, at Ontario Tech University, and I'm the director of the STEAM 3D Maker Lab. And with me today, I have um, Margie Lamb, Laura Morrison, Jennifer Robb, and Laura Dobos. Uh, all of these students are graduate students um, working with me in one capacity or another, and uh, I can't, I wouldn't be able to do what I do um, in the lab without uh, their help. So I'm very thankful that they're here today. Um, you'll notice in the uh, slides at the bottom of the screen, there's a link to our lab website where there are lots of different kinds of resources, including some recordings of other um, seminars and sessions that we've been running for educators since COVID-19 hit us. So we're going to be talking today about, in general, about best practices for online teaching and learning. Um, and um, I've been teaching online at the tertiary level for 23 years now. Um, so these are best practices based on my experience as well as from the research. We'll also be talking about ways that you can structure your classes online, including looking at how to flip your classroom and then um, we'll talk about some further considerations for online learning, uh, specifically related to STEM. And uh, each of the lab members that I've introduced will be taking the lead on leading us through demonstrations of Screencast-O-Matic, which will help people record uh, short video clips to use with their students, um, an interactive whiteboard, FET, and Desmos. And depending on the will of the group, at the end, we can have an open question and answer period, or we've also um, set up some breakout groups. So you can, have, uh, you can go to a breakout session and, and get hands-on with some of these um, tools and resources. I'm assuming everybody knows the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning. Um, anybody in this group at least. And, but I, I will be using these terms back and forth for the duration of the, the, the introduction that I give. So I wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we're talking about synchronous teaching and learning, we're talking about communication that occurs in real time. So if some examples are Zoom, which we're on now, uh, Skype, Google Meet, which is the platform that my team and I have been using for teacher sessions. Um, and there are some benefits for uh, of using synchronous um, platforms and synchronous teaching. Um, probably the most important is that it's the students get immediate feedback, and I would argue that it's more responsive interaction. Obviously, obviously you're live. In many cases, you're um, face to face because you're using video. Um, one of the drawbacks of synchronous teaching and learning, of course, is that not everybody can attend live meetings, which is one of the reasons we're recording this session. Asynchronous teaching and learning communication occurs at different times. So everybody can come in when they're um, able to come in, depending on their own schedules. So one of the real benefits of asynchronous learning is that there's more think time. There are, can be more in-depth responses because of that additional think time. And I mentioned the flexibility. Asynchronous um, feedback uh, and, um, and, and uh, responses are really, um, it's really important that things are timely, consistent, predictable, um, and I'm going to give you some examples based on a course that I teach in the graduate program in my faculty in just a few minutes. So here um, is a lovely graphic and I like this graphic and um, because it shows the difference between the various ways of doing online learning. So you have um, 
you have high immediacy and low immediacy. That would be the interaction with your students. And then you have high bandwidth and low uh, bandwidth. And so depending on your student's ability and access to get online, um, you can tailor the kinds of things that you do when you're doing online teaching and learning. Um, in my case, I use all of these. Every one of these black boxes is, is uh, a strategy and a technique that I use. So in terms of low immediacy but high bandwidth, um, asynchronous discussions with video and audio would fall into that, com uh, that cate category or quadrant, um, as well as pre-recorded video um, and audio. And that's what Screencast-O-Matic is going to help you be able to do. On the um, top right quadrant in the red, we have things like Zoom, Google Meet, so high immediacy, but also high bandwidth. So depending on, again, um, your students' access and connectivity, uh, this may be possible, but it might be difficult for some students. Um, and then in the lower left quadrant, we have low immediacy, low bandwidth uh, strategies. So for example, discussion boards, um, lot, all M LMSs have discussion boards, learning management systems. You can also post readings with, with text and images. And of course, there's good old fashioned email, um, which I don't recommend highly actually. We'll talk about alternatives to email. And then in the final blue quadrant, we have high immediacy and low bandwidth. So that includes things like um, group chats and messaging, but also working on collaborative documents, for example, in Google Drive or in Google Docs. Okay, moving on to best practices. So I have about, uh, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 tips for teaching online in general. And the three principles that are the most important in terms of teaching online are teacher presence, social presence, and cognitive presence. And so when we talk about teacher presence, um, we're talking about how often is the teacher online, what kind of inter interactivity is happening uh, on the teacher or the instructor's part, um, but being present is extremely important. We also have social presence, which is the student's ability to collaborate and connect with each other as well as with the instructor. And then we have cognitive presence, which is really um, intellectual engagement with the content in the course. So in order to be present, instructors need to communicate regularly. And that communication can happen in a variety of ways. And I'll go over some of those. Um, instructors also need to be be present to monitor discussion. Um, sometimes when, if you're, for example, doing a discussion on, a, on, on Blackboard or Canvas uh, on your LMS, um, discussion may consist of uh, really short kinds of, you know, going in, answering a question, and then leaving and never returning again to the discussion. So instructors, if you're present um, on those discussion boards or in those forums, you can uh, prompt, prompt more discussion. Um, also setting clear guidelines about when you will be available, both synchronously and asynchronously. Um, if you have a policy about not being available after in the evenings or on weekends, students need to know that so that they're not waiting to be uh, to, to ask questions or to get feedback. And then I recommend setting up synchronous meetups in small groups or individually if possible. And of course, all of these things are going to be um, based on how large your classes are and how much time you have and how many classes you're teaching. So being present is important. Creating community is also important. And if you know your Vygotsky, you know that students learn best in a community. So if you can build in spaces um, either synchronously or asynchronously for students to connect. Um, so discussion forums, but also alternative collaboration platforms. For example, Facebook, class Facebook could be set up or Instagram. Um, I always create a class hashtag on Twitter so that students can post to it. But there's also tools like Padlet or Jamboard 
that allow that you can set up as an instructor as a, as a class that are um, that are private. Only people with a password can get in, and they can have conversations on those um, platforms as well. I also recommend that you establish smaller groups, um, especially if you have a large class and you're working in an LMS, because um, even with discussion threads, people can get lost in discussion. One of the things that I do, because I teach in a faculty of education and I work with K-12 educators as well as higher education profs and people in industry, is I divide the, uh, the students into groups according to the division that they teach in. So I, I will say, okay, primary and junior uh, teachers will be in this group, um, intermediate and senior like high school teachers will be in this group, higher educators in this group, and so on. So if there is a natural kind of division that you can break the students out into, into groups by, um, I highly recommend you do that as well. Establishing clear expectations um, is really key. Students learn best when the online content is organized in a very logical and consistent way. So students should be able to, to know where to go to find things. Um, deadlines should be consistent. So if you're asking them, for example, to post um, on the discussion forum, then you, you might say you must post every Friday by noon or um, assignments are due at, at, uh, by midnight. Um, on the uh, you know at the end of every second week, um, this kind of clear communication and clear expectations helps reduce students' cognitive load and prevents them from becoming frustrated. Um, also, how will you communicate with students and and then being consistent? So if you don't want your email. Um, inbox to be flooded, find a way of communicating with students either via your LMS or some other way. Um, I don't recommend giving out your phone number so that students can text you. Um, I, however, I do do this with my grad students who are a small groups. So it again depends on your context. Um, I also think it's important to remind students at the beginning of every week what is happening that week. And I know some of you may be thinking that this is hand-holding or coddling, um, but I do this even with my graduate students and they are very um, appreciative of, of this kind of organization. Um, it helps reduce frustration for sure. Um, as with face-to-face -face teaching, variety is always important. So creating opportunities for students to learn in um, large group, small group, and uh, individual settings is really important. Um, things like case studies, for example, are especially conducive for students working in teams and in all kinds of project-based learning, which is the kind of teaching and learning um, uh, I regularly have my students engage in. And also being able to offer a balance between synchronous and asynchronous, if that's at all possible. Regular check-ins are really important as well. We all have course um, evaluations, I'm sure, but waiting until the end of the course is finished to find out how the students felt about the, uh, the course and their learning, I think is too late. Might help for the next time around, but really we need to make sure that students um, are engaged and know what's happening um, throughout the course. So you can ask for informal feedback. I use the start, stop, continue um, technique or strategy. Um, but you can, you can ask for informal feedback in, in whatever way you find um, um, convenient to you. So you could also collect this in a Google form rather than by email to avoid flooding your inbox. I mentioned discussion prompts earlier, but um, and, and I also mentioned the asynchronous discussion allows time for deep reflection. 
uh, we know that open-ended questions are always better for encouraging creative and critical thinking. Um, but what we often get in a, in a discussion board is what I call hit and run postings, where students are required to post something, for example, about a reading. So they formulate their response, then they copy and paste it into the discussion board, and they're never seen again until the next time that they have to post something. This doesn't really promote meaningful conversation or discussion. Um, so it ties into being present and asking uh, probing questions, um, asking students to clarify what they mean by certain things, um, and also encouraging students to respond to each other in meaningful ways. I often tell them at the beginning of a course that a follow-up uh, post to some one of their peers um, doesn't really count if it's um, as simple as, oh, I agree with Julie, um, and that's it. The, the, I, what I tell my students is every, every um, response that they leave should forward the conversation in some way. I think this one, easy access to resources goes without saying, but um, now when students can't get to actual physical libraries, using digital content is more um, is more important than ever and also making sure that it's easily accessible so checking the links to make sure that they still work especially if it's uh, a link that you found last time you taught the course so testing all of those things out um, providing resources in a digital form so taking a photograph or scanning it um, on your iPhone if you have an iPhone you have a built-in scanner or you can download an app um, but the notes app in on the iPhone works really well for scanning. And I already mentioned the links. And then making learning visible. So because you're not physically in the classroom with your students, um, you can't walk around while they're working on a task. So how can you have them make their learning visible so that you understand um, not only you know where where they get to an answer but how that they how they got there so looking at the process as opposed to just the product and i always ask the students to record their thinking and learning processes so how are they creating and talking and writing and explaining and analyzing and judging um, all of these things and um, i have my students collect all of these kinds of what I call digital artifacts, things that they create with various learning uh, digital tools, and I have them put it into a repository of some site, sort. So they usually create a website, although they can have a blog. And the lots of really easy ones for students to use, like um, Wix, um, Weebly, Google Sites, um, any kind of blog. Um, and of course, using project-based learning works really well for this, this, this kind of an assignment. Um, and I mentioned already creating a repository for their assignments. They can do this on a website and they provide you with a link so you can see how it progresses over the course of, of your course. Um, but they can also, you can also create something for them as well where they can put things. It can either be in your LMS or it can be on a class wiki. I'm going to show you what I use, which is a Ning. So I mentioned flipped learning or flipping your classroom. And I really like this. Um, this is how I teach all of my online courses. So what we do in class, which for me is synchronous and I use Google or sorry I use uh, Adobe Connect um, our program uses Adobe Connect um, but whatever you're using that time that you're spending together synchronously should be used for um, for for students to have uh, discussions and practice applying the key concepts with that kind of immediate feedback you can provide for them because you are there with them synchronously you can use asynchronous communication before class and after class um, to help them prepare to participate in class activities. So for example, you can pre-record your lecture notes um, or your slides. 
and provide those ahead of time, or you can provide students with uh, course readings ahead of time. And then after class, um, to check for understanding and extend the student's learning. And I'm going to show you an example of my flipped classroom in, in just a second. So what are the positives and negatives of flipping your classroom? Um, the positives are that you have more one-on-one -on -one class time with the instructor and the instructor has more time in, in class synchronously with students. Um, Another thing I really like about flipping the classroom is that students learn and relearn at their own pace. Um, they decide when they're going to look at the slides, when they're going to do the readings, um, as long as they're prepared for class. Breakout rooms also uh, enable students to learn from each other during class time. So as I mentioned before, making sure that students have um, a, a combination of whole class but small group learning as well. The negatives include screen time, and I think in uh, the era of COVID-19, we're spending a lot more time on screen than we have uh, in the past, and that's just, I think, our reality for the foreseeable future. Um, the initial workload increases for the instructor because you're preparing all of these things. But once you have them, you have them. And even though you might need to modify them, um, you can go back and reuse some of your content. Um, and the other thing that concerns me a great deal, actually, is the impact of the digital divide on students. So those learners who come from lower socioeconomic households where um, they don't have as, um, as, as much bandwidth, uh, their connectivity is not as good um, and maybe they don't even have access to the best um, and most up-to-date devices or hardware. So that is always a concern. So I'm just going to take you into one of my classes. This is a, um, a series of online modules that um, we've created and I use this with my grad course and the grad course that I've been teaching most recently is called critical making um, and it is um, it's a very hands-on course but it is done fully online and um, the way that I, I'll show you the way that I am able to do that so basically what I've done is I've established uh, just using a Weebly very easy website is I've established um, the, the website, the course website, and I've divided it into modules, as you can see here. Um, so every module is the same. Remember what I said about consistency and clear expectations? So it's, everything is set up the same, so there are no surprises. And I'll just take you into a random module. Um, so module three is about wearable technologies or e-textiles. And so students read the introduction, and they um, are able to get uh, information about what I mean by e-textiles or wearables, what are the benefits in education. But down here, and this never changes for each module, we have another link that will take us to research or to the media that they need to access. And then finally, what are the activities related to uh, this particular module? So if I click on research, it gives them the required readings and I might not have them do all of these readings. I might just say choose two or choose one and, and, and do a, a quick summary and review. Um, but the readings are there. There's also additional or optional readings. So they also have media that they can look at. And these, these are a, uh, a collection of various tutorials about how to get started. And often, you can see here, I've created a basic tutorial. Well, these are actually, I didn't even create these tutorials. I just um, found them and curated them. So there's one for um, intro. So beginners, there's one for intermediates, and there's one for advanced. So students who already have some um, understanding of e-textiles so that they're not all starting in the same place. So they get to choose. 
There are also lots of additional resources here in the form of videos and um, then we have the activities. So if we click on the activities, again, I can decide which ones of these activities they're going to do. They might do all of them, they might do um, one of them, or they might um, hack the assignment. In other words, they can choose to do something else related to wearables and e-textiles, but they have to um, get that approved by me first. So each one of the um, modules is, is formatted exactly like this. So that is sort of how I flip the classroom. And then I've created a Ning for them. So this is a sandbox platform. Um, it, it does require um, you to pay for the service, but it's very inexpensive. So I, uh, I do that. Whoops, I need to go back. Um, so what I like about Ning is it's set up very much like Facebook. Um, you have your page, you have your members. I can click on that link. These are just screen caps right now. I'm not going to take you into the course, but I can go in and I can see the stats for what everybody has done. How many blog posts, how many discussions they've posted, how many videos, how many photographs, etc. I also can link to things like Google Docs so students can work together. Um, but every student has their individual blog in this site so they can reflect on their learning and that's what the students are doing. This, this particular student is doing for week six. Um, there are also forum discussions and um, I set those up at the beginning of every week for each module. You'll notice that there's even um, an, an inbox so you, I can have my students um, connect with me or email me within the Ning as well. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And I think that's where uh, my portion of this presentation uh, ends. So that was half an hour, perfect timing. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer Robb and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, um, Jen, and you can take over. Okay, so hopefully that went seamlessly and you're now looking at my screen. So as Jeanette mentioned, a big part of flipping the classroom um, incorporates video and video content. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next little bit, uh, next 15 minutes or so. Uh, so in this instance, screen recording is specifically what we're looking at. So what do I mean by screen recording? Um, so when we're talking about screen recording, or you might also hear it referred to as screen capturing, what we mean is using some sort of software program to create a video that captures something on your computer desktop. Um, these sorts of videos can also be created with or without your webcam visible and with or without added narration from you, the instructor, depending on what it is that your goals are. These videos can take multiple forms. So you could be creating a short tutorial for students to access a particular online resource that you'd like them to use. Um, you might be recording some sort of overview of an assignment or an inquiry based activity you'd like them to complete. Or you might maybe record videos for uh, providing feedback or assessment. There's a ton of different reasons you might choose to screen record content. So on top of that, why do we record video content as opposed to just providing text based uh, resources. Obviously, we want our students to learn and uh, recording videos is one way that we can sort of substitute having a physical teaching presence. Um, but there are a number of other ways that video recorded content can actually enhance our online teaching. So first, it can be a little bit more efficient. In many cases, we can quite easily uh, compact long passages of information um, or, you know, that you would get from an article or a textbook into a shorter video accompanied by rel relevant visuals. Um, and then this makes it much easier for students to rewatch and uh, revise their sort of understanding of this content from, say, a five to six minute video, as opposed to an article or a textbook passage that may take them, you know, 25 minutes to read or more. Um, secondly, recording videos allows for a little bit more sort of uh, improvisation and storytelling. 
you could theoretically just provide students with those asynchronous text-based resources um, or like a set of slides or a Google Doc with some instructions. But recording a video with your own narration provides space for you to tell stories, uh, anecdotes, and little tidbits of information that may not fit naturally onto a set of slides. Uh, and this may then help students' comprehension of the material, as well as their ability to personally relate to what it is you're asking of them. Uh, and similarly, there are cer certain things that just don't come through text. So emotions, behaviors, and cultural narrative. Like the previous point, the additions of these things through video content can really help uh, establish a personal connection with your students, even through this period of physical isolation, and provide a little bit more content and context to the information that you're trying to communicate. And one other reason not included on this slide is accessibility, and that's a really big one for us in the lab. Um, for some of our students, reading text can present a, quite an issue uh, and a challenge, so providing some other option in tandem with the text that you're providing can really help reduce the cognitive load for those students. So there's always, you know, some best practices around there for using some of these resources. Um, and one of these is to keep in mind that slides and internet resources uh, shouldn't be seen as a replacement for the instructional content. Maybe we can't stand up physically and interact with our students anymore, um, but these sorts of things should complement one another as opposed to one replacing the other. Um, research has shown that although students really appreciate having access to slides and lecture content, uh, and they do believe that they enhance their distance learning, there was one survey conducted that found that students described instructional content via video as essential and indispensable at the tertiary level. Another thing to consider while planning and recording your videos is that the verbal narration you're providing should directly relate to the visuals presented on screen. Our students only have so much cognitive processing power and one way to reduce their cognitive load during this time is to ensure that these two sources of information complement one another to maximize working memory capacity rather than compete for cognitive resources. Uh, another best practice for recording video content is to segment or chunk your lectures into shorter uh, topic focused videos. Um, this makes it easier for not only students because they're more willing to watch them um, and actually able to learn for them, um, but it also lightens your load as the instructor. Recording a very long video, and this is something I have experience with from us recording our sessions recently, um, and then trying to chunk it afterwards and edit it and edit out all the awkward things that come up, um, takes time that, frankly, none of us have right now. Uh, so if you make it a point to record shorter videos, it's better for you and the students. Um, and to that point, research has actually shown that keeping videos to a maximum of six minutes in length tends to be ideal for engagement. Uh, any longer than that, and student engagement tends to drop. So in a survey of nearly 7 million video watching sessions, um, once videos reach that 9 to 12 minute mark, the median engagement dropped to 50%. And anything beyond that saw a median engagement of about 20%. Uh, so any longer than six minutes and you're starting to lose your students. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, and the final best practice I'll mention here is that if you can, try to inter integrate interactive elements into your videos. Um, passively watching videos, and we know this from learning from anything like that, um, passively watching videos isn't enough to promote learning. Students need to actually get in there and actively engage with the material that's being presented. Um, so you can do this in a number of ways. There are video creation platforms and even video hosting platforms that enable you to embed interactive elements like quizzes, uh, question answer, discussion forums right alongside the video, which I've linked a little bit later uh, in the slides here and we'll show you that very briefly. Um, but if you can't do that because you don't have access to the resources or you're just simply not comfortable with it, it's easy enough to do this by integrating uh, interactivity through your learning management system alongside the video. So during this session, I'm just going to give you a very quick demo of Screencast-O-Matic, which is a tool we've been using recently, and it is possibly one of the easiest tools to really use um, for screen recording lesson content. Um, so one advantage of this tool is that it is web-based, you do have to download a small plugin to use it, but it's not a big uh, clunky program that you have to worry about dealing with. It does work just straight out of your browser. There's a ton of options for Screencast-O-Matic accounts. Um, there's free and then you get into the paid tiers. However, from my uh, experience with this tool, the free accounts are really all you need. 
Um, they give you a, the ability to record videos of up to 15 minutes in length, which is perfect for what we're wanting to do. Um, and they also give you a small background audio library, not that you would use it likely for most of your purposes, um, but really that's all you need. So as an institution, if you choose to look into this a little bit more deeply, you may choose to look at some of the more deluxe uh, packages for accounts, but in this transition, we really don't need them. So on these slides, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to find a way to provide you these slides, but I have provided a couple of reference slides for Screencast-O-Matic to show you where some of the various options are. Um, but instead of doing that now, I'm just going to actually exit the presentation here and take you through Screencast-O-Matic itself. So once you've logged into Screencast-O-Matic here, um, this is what your dashboard tends to look like. So it takes you directly to the screen where if you've recorded previous videos, you have them uploaded here. Also a way for you to organize them into folders for your own purposes and channels if you want to just share uh, your videos directly with students from this platform. Um, but then in the top right corner, you also have the launcher and the editor, which with a free account, you get a very short trial of. So to launch the program, all we need to do is click on this here and it's going to begin to launch ask me for permission to open it, and then we're gonna go ahead with it. Once it launches, it might take a little bit longer here. Okay, so my audio might sound a little bit different now that we're in here. You can see that there's a microphone uh, gauge here, so it is showing me that it is recording my audio content, so that's always a plus. Um, but this is your interface once you've launched the recorder. Very simple to use. Um, typically what I'll do is decide first whether I want to record just my screen, um, if I want to record just my webcam, or if I want to have both. Typically I do want to have both. As we mentioned, this can be a good substitute for physical teaching presence, so having your webcam is great. But there are instances where maybe you don't want this. Um, nicely, there is a little dialogue in the bottom here that you can change on the fly. So if you're recording a short video and you decide that there's an instance where you want them to focus on you and what it is that you're talking about, you can click this larger webcam image to pop up your webcam larger, or you can make it go away entirely. So you can do this in the video as well. There's some other options here that we can't really edit at the time because we are working on a free account. So the max time is 15 minutes. Um, and the size of your recording is gonna depend on what you've dragged to record here. So right now, this sort of uh, dashed frame around the outside is what's being recorded. If I wanted to, let's say, tab back into our presentation here, and record only the PowerPoint, or the Google Slides, I should say, um, that is something that I can do. So I've set it so it's only going to record the slides, and you can see it's changed the size of my recording as well. There's some other preferences you can go into and set, but most of them you don't really need unless you really wanna get into using computer hotkeys. Um, but once you're ready to record, you can just click the record button, and it'll give you a nice little countdown. And once you're recording, you are good to start recording. So uh, since I've recorded or I've restricted the frame here just to focus on the slides, in this video here, it's going to record the slides as I'm clicking through them. Um, and I could be speaking to these slides here, uh, talking a little bit about them, pausing to emphasize a point. Um, for my purposes, I've made my cursor comically large so you can see what I'm pointing to, um, but you might wanna emphasize some points. Um, if you lose your train of thought, as I tend to do, you can hit the little pause button here and it'll pause the recording. And you can take a second to reevaluate what you're thinking, what you're doing, and what your next steps are. And then you can go ahead and you can record again. And it'll give you your countdown and you're good to go. Ultimately, when you are finished recording, you just simply pause the recording. Uh, you can say that you are done, or if you hated your video altogether, you can delete everything and start over. But for our purposes, we're just going to say that we are finished and it'll ask us what we want to do next. So we can go straight to the save and upload. Uh, you can quick share it. So this will upload it directly to the Screencast-O-Matic servers. Or if you have the trial, it'll let you edit it. Um, full disclosure, I don't find the Screencast-O-Matic editor to be particularly helpful. So I would just ignore that. So we're gonna go to the save and upload here. If you wanna make any changes, this is the time. Um, I'm not sure why in this instance, it's done this a couple times where it's recorded it backwards. It seems to do that sometimes. I'm not sure why. I haven't been able to troubleshoot that, but it did it once before. Um, but hopefully for you, it didn't do that. 
And here's where you could say, if you did a lot of ums and pauses, you can trim your video section and it'll show you where it's going to start. You can play back here to see how your video was recorded. So in our instance, we know that for some reason it was backwards. Um, but if you're ultimately happy with it, you have a couple of options for exporting here. You can save it to your computer as a video file, which is typically what we like to do, as then we will upload it to our learning management system um, or we'll upload it directly to our website. That may be something you wanna do. Also, if you are a little bit more tech savvy and you do wanna edit your video a little bit, saving it as an MP4 will then let you take it into your desired video editing program. Um, you can choose to upload it directly to the Screencast-O-Matic servers. Like we saw before, that'll dump it on your dashboard and you can organize it accordingly. Or you can also link, uh, if you have one, a class YouTube channel directly to Screencast-O-Matic and you can do a one-click upload. I tend not to do this because our home internet speeds are much worse than our institutional internet speeds, so I tend to upload all my videos overnight. Um, but that is something you may choose to do. It's entirely up to you. But once you've saved it, it'll ask you to set a file name, uh, what type, you have a couple of options, whether or not you want your cursor to be highlighted, which I would recommend doing, especially if you're showing students some instructions. Um, and then you can go ahead and publish it. I'm going to stop just for my purposes because we don't need to save this video right now. Um, and I'll return to the slideshow just to show you a couple more things that will give you a little bit more access to later on if we can get you these slides. So as I mentioned, I've included some references in the slides for how to use Screencast-O-Matic and where some of the features are that I just described. Um, if you missed it and you wanna revisit it later, um, there are also some slides in here to show how to do basically the exact same thing with PowerPoint. Uh, only difference here is that you don't get to include your webcam in PowerPoint, it's strictly the screen. So there's a couple of reference points in here for that. And then I've also included a couple of slides which might be worth reviewing later for some other tools that you might wanna look at for a screen recording. Some of these are much more user-friendly than others. I highly recommend Camtasia Studio if your institution has the license for it, most do. Um, and it's fantastic and lets you do a lot of snazzy things to make your videos really engaging and fun. And it does let you embed interactivity directly into your video, which is great um, in the form of quizzes and that sort of thing. And I've also included a slide of some other things you might wanna look at. So if you don't have access to Camtasia or those other interactive uh, video editors, some of these are platforms where you can take your video, upload it, and build interactivity around it. So Edpuzzle, uh, PlayPosit, Articulate Storyline 360, you can really start to create really interactive, engaging experiences using these screen recording videos that you have just created. So that is me for screen recording. Um, I am just going to stop sharing my screen here. Oops. And pass it over to, I believe, Laura Morrison is next up. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I'll just get set up here. All right, so I believe you can see my screen now. Um, Jen, can you just let me know if you can see both these tabs that I'm toggling back and forth between? Yeah, you are good to go. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so just to give you an overview, um, we're gonna be focusing mostly today on a whiteboard called Explain Everything. Uh, there's a couple different options for whiteboards that I've also included in the slides, but Explain Everything is the whiteboard um, that I've used the most often, and I find that it's uh, a little bit more dynamic than some of the other whiteboards out there. This will be um, particularly of interest for people who are running sessions where they need to be able to draw either mathematical concepts um, or have students show their work um, and submit kind of process work related to mathematical concepts that you as the teacher can then um, review and potentially provide feedback on and send back to the students. So there is a video recording function that allows you to have a kind of um, interactive back and forth conversation with students depending on um, the work that they submit. So explain everything. Um, it allows you to demonstrate concepts in real time. So that would be through your synchronous sessions. It also allows you to collaborate with people. So if you have the free version, you can collaborate with up to eight people. Um, if you have the paid version, it's more. Um, the other thing that it allows you to do is create short videos. So in the free version, I believe it's up to a minute long videos that allow you to demonstrate um, 
quick concepts that can then be shared asynchronously. So if you uh, don't have a lot of synchronous time, but you want to share some quick information with students, you can create a video in Explain Everything and um, share it with them. So I'll just pop over to the actual whiteboard. So the link is uh, whiteboard.explaineverything.com. And when you open it up on your screen, you see um, you've got three different options with how you want to start your whiteboard. So I'll just click on the template because it gives you a quick overview of the different possibilities that you can use for backgrounds. Um, one of them is storyboarding, Venn diagrams, other mind mapping type tools. And then there's the possibility for you to embed a video and then have some sort of diagrams or mind maps at the bottom that you're speaking to or mathematical concepts, whatever it is that you're using. Uh, for the purposes of today, I'm just going to click whiteboard because we just want a plain back whiteboard. And um, I do not teach higher level math, but <laughs> we have been doing some elementary math with students in the STEAM 3D lab. So just to give you an overview of the different features of the whiteboard, um, I'm going to use a lesson that we did recently on elementary math. So keep in mind um, all of the features that I'm showing you and how you might incorporate them into your own uh, tertiary level math or science STEM subjects. So fun fact, uh, you'll probably want to mute your mic if you're um, just wanting to capture what's happening on the screen without audio. We recently tried this out where um, Jeanette and I did a back and forth um, math concept where I gave her a math concept to solve. She solved the math concept, recorded her, um, her process work, sent it back to me, and uh, the tab for explain everything was open. She closed her computer and I could still hear what was going on at her house. So <laughs> there are privacy concerns that we just, um, we just found out about. So when you enable your mic, um, if the tab is open and you've shared the explain everything board with somebody, you still have access to hearing what's happening at their house unless you hit mute mic or close the tab entirely. So just something to keep in mind. So I'm going to hit mute mic and join. And I'm going to demonstrate the uh, solving surface area. So what we did recently with students is we had them create uh, nets to find out the surface area of cubes. And um, we started out by, I'm just going to go to clip art. We started out by having them um, looking at a diagram of a cube. So in Explain Everything, on the left hand side, you've got a whole bunch of different tools that you can use to uh, create all sorts of different content in your white space or on your whiteboard. So when I hit the Add Media tab, it allowed me to add a whole bunch of different, and I'll actually just go back, um, pictures, you can add screenshots, you can upload existing files, clip art. Um, so I had hit clip art and the shapes, so I inserted a cube, you can resize. You know, so we talked about the shape of the cube, and then um, to have them understand the surface area of each side, we wanted to unpack the cube so that we could see what the cube looked like as a two-dimensional object. So on the side here, you'll notice that there's a shapes function. So we chose uh, this square shape. So you're able to then add shapes. And then instead of uh, recreating the shape multiple times, you're able to go to uh, the editor. And then you're able to duplicate. So I'm going to do this six times. Okay. And then you can select with the hand tool moving the shapes around. So I know I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to try to do this relatively quickly, so it's not going to look perfect. Um, but then you're able to show, or we were able to show a cube um, unpacked in this two-dimensional uh, net shape. So we told the students, I'm just going to go over to the pen, that the entire surface area of the cube was 150 centimeters squared. So you can see now you're able to not only have um, preset objects, made objects, you're also able to actually write on the whiteboard. 
So we told them you have this um, as your total surface area and we're trying to solve the length and width of each side. So I asked the students then if we know the total surface area, how can we figure out what each of these um, square surface area is? And so they divided by six and one of my students told me, okay, each is 25. So we were able to write directly on the board. And then we were able to break it down even further because we knew each of these sides would be equal. And then we had a discussion about how we would solve that. Okay, and then we were able to go over to the highlight. And I was like, highlight one area. Okay, let's figure out what that is. And then they broke it down and they were able to figure out that each side was five. And now there's another tool that allows you to select a certain area. That's not perfect, but you get the idea. So you can select a certain area, bring it out, and talk about one portion of whatever equation that you're working with. Um, there's also the erase tab because there's some extra dots down here. So I'm going to erase quickly. Um, so that is essentially some of the basic tools. You can even add text. So right here, if they hadn't yet solved this equation, I could say, what are the lengths? And side. And then we can even emphasize it with the pointer tool. So you'll see the red dot that highlights, so it just draws their attention. And then if you wanted to delete one thing or multiple items, you just drag across and delete. So that is uh, just a quick example of. Uh, one way you can use it for math. The last example that I want to show you, which should only take five minutes because I think that's all I have left, uh, is to show you how to create animations into video cord. So I'm just going to bring up um, a picture of the earth and then the moon. So you'll see what, what happens when you load pictures. So you get taken to the image editor. You can make some quick tweaks like rotating the image or cropping. Then you'll hit done, the image appears. Um, I'm now going to add a second image. I'm going to add the moon because I'm going to make a quick animation of the moon going around the earth. And um, this is actually a tutorial that they've embedded in Explain Everything. So if you go through those tutorials, you, you might see it as well. So I was able to resize the earth. I'm going to put it over here. And then down at the bottom, this is where you'll see the record feature. So you can hit start recording. And you'll see uh, the timing has started. So you can uh, tell that you're uh, in action. So now I'm going to make the moon go around the earth. It's going to come back to the beginning. I'm going to hit pause. And now the editing options appear at the bottom here. So we want to see that that recording worked. So we'll go back to the beginning, hit play. There was a bit of talk at the beginning, so that's why there's a lot of blank space there. This is where we know an animation has happened. So that's the earth going around, or the moon going around the earth, and then stopping. And now because we have a lot of animation, or we have a lot of blank space at the beginning, we might want to go back and select. So over here, this is the select tool. So we can select, and you'll notice we're selecting by moving, and the blue shows us that we're highlighting the selected area. And then this function here allows you to delete what you've just highlighted and compress. So I'm going to do delete and compress, and now you'll see all that's taken off. And now the animation is much um, more compact. So you could be narrating a description over top of that. Um, this is something that you could then share with students or if you've done some sort of mathematical equation that you're then asking your students to solve you could send it to them they could record their own process send it back to you and then you can review it as the teacher and if you wanted to add feedback on you know something they've done well or something that they've missed you can actually hit overwrite you can go back to whatever point it is in their um, work that you want to comment on, hit record, and you can uh, 
uh, record your voice over top of what they've um, done in their video. So I'll just stop recording there. Um, there's a couple other features that you could play around with. Um, you, you definitely need the law or the upgraded version to have uh, more features, but down at the bottom, you're able to change the color of the background. Um, you're also able to upload an image and set it as the background. So maybe you've, you want like a, there's like a slide of different concepts that you want to work with, but you want it to be a static background that you can then use the pen tool to write over top. You can do that as well. Um, so I'll stop there because I know I only have one minute left. And uh, if you do end up having questions or we have time to do the breakout room, you can come to the whiteboard session and you can play around with all these features um, hands on. The last thing that I just wanted to point out is that if you did want to use the collaborative function up at the top, that's where you would hit invite and it gives you a code that you can then share with other people. Um, and then everybody can instantly interact with the whiteboard. You can video record the entire session. So everybody who's within the whiteboard, maybe solving math problems or um, you know, doing some sort of collaborative mind map, you can record that and then have that as a way of you know, knowing what the students worked on or recording the learning process. All right, I think that's it. I'm on the hour. So I am going to stop sharing and hand it over, I think it's to Laura Dobos. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so let me just All right. Can Laura, can you see the different tabs I have? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just uh, be talking to you guys about FET. Um, it's a really, really awesome uh, simulation software. Um, it was designed by the University of Colorado, specifically uh, Carl Wyman. Um, and it's, it's a design based or a design process uh, research based simulation software. Um, so you'll see in the bottom left corner here of this slide, I've, I've inserted their design process. They've actually published uh, quite a few different research papers. Um, so this is taken from that, but a lot of their simulations are fully research based. Um, so they start off with learning goals. They have a team of, of about five people who um, look at learning goals and look at kind of what the goal of a specific simulation is. They then work together to create the initial design with software developers. Um, so the simulations that they have put together are super user friendly. They're really, really easy to just kind of follow along. Um, and I mean, I love them. I've used them with students so many times in the past um, because I find that they're very effective in demonstrating more abstract kind of concepts. Um, so if you're talking with your students about waves, um, radio waves, x-ray waves, whatever it is, things that they can't actually see in the real world, this brings that to life. Um, so they go into the initial design with the software developer. They then have interviews with students. Um, so they have students try it. I think they said about five students try it and then they get feedback. They go back and redesign. They then have interviews um, with students again to say, okay, were we effective in redesigning? And then they try it in the classroom. So one of the um, people that's in the initial group that put that creates the simulation is a teacher. So they'll actually use it in their classroom, get feedback from the teacher, from the students, and then go on to create their final design. Um, so that's kind of one of my favorite parts of it is it is research based. Uh, there's tons of simulations out there that you can use with students, but I find that the FET ones are super effective. Um, I included this paper because I thought it was, again, it's really important that I think it's really important that it's research based information because um, there are so many options out there for teachers. So if we're using the um, more effective simulations, I think it's a good thing to do. So um, I linked that video or that paper in there if you'd like to take a look, but it just kind of explains what I just explained. Um, so why might you use FET? Um, it, it creates really engaging asynchronous lessons. So on this, unfortunately, you can't collaborate uh, like the whiteboard. 
Um, so you can't really do synchronous lessons super effectively unless as the teacher you're going through the simulation and you are sharing your screen with your students, which is also a really effective way to do it. Um, I find it better when, if by giving them a, an asynchronous activity that includes going through the simulation on their own so they can actually go through and um, play around with the different controls, uh, look at the different aspects of the concept and actually apply it to their own learning. Um, it helps demonstrate abstract mathematical concepts, which I kind of explained um, before. The thing with math, and I think it's the thing that, that a lot of students have a hard time with, is conceptualizing the ideas um, that aren't super visible to them in the real world. So using a simulation um, software similar to this helps to create those uh, visual kind of concepts. Um, it also makes real world connections. So you can see here, I've just taken a screen cap of some of the math concepts. Um, the ones on here, a lot of them are quite kind of elementary, but there are some that are higher level. Um, I'll show you in a minute how they've broken it down and the, how you can search for the different concepts on the website. But um, there's tons of different examples of how you can um, apply this simulation in the math classroom. Um, so vector addition. Vectors, I mean, for me, vectors were always something quite difficult for me to conceptualize because, again, it's on a graph paper and it's hard to see the real world connections of it. Um, so vector addition, um, I've just, again, taken the screen cap of this activity from FET. The really, really awesome thing that they do for every single simulation on there is they have this PDF with tips for teachers. Um, so whether you're teaching this for the first time or you, uh, are having a hard time using the software, there's insights into, okay, what is each component of the screen? Um, you can show or hide your vector data at the top. As you can see, you can choose your equation type depending on what uh, concept they're learning at the time. Um, you, can, you can move these different um, vectors around so you can actually see the addition of it to see how that um, is actually done. Um, it gives you insights into student use. And this is where the research component really comes into play because um, as students use this kind of a software, they're going, to come, they're going to interact with it differently, but they're also going to um, come in contact with the same kind of issues. So these are some of the kind of um, issues that they recognized in the research. So as a teacher, it's really, really awesome to have that kind of insight so that you can pre-plan for those kind of misconceptions and address them with the students. Um, okay. All right, so I have a few links that I just am going to take you through on the website. This PDF um, FET actually put together, because they are a university that has put together this whole database of simulations, um, I think they have a bit more insight as to how students can use it and how teachers can use it in various kinds of um, environments. Obviously, with the pandemic right now, we're not sitting in a lecture, we're not sitting in a classroom where the teacher can explain the concept through that way. Um, but kind of in tandem with a lot of the other technologies that we've shown you today um, thus far, you can create lecture type lessons with this kind of um, software using the screen record. Um, so using it as visual aids and demos. Right now we can't get into the classroom to use the um, equipment that you would normally have in a, in a lab kind of uh, setting. So through using a simulation like this, students can interact with that kind of hands-on component of um, the classroom. Student-driven discussions, so you can be doing whole class inquiry. So if you were to do a synchronous lesson with this, um, having students ask questions as you go through the process, as you go through the simulation, um, is a really awesome way to use this software. Uh, we, there's also a lot of universities uh, utilize clickers, which help um, the teacher see kind of the understanding of the students as they go through the lesson. So um, posing questions throughout the lesson to get that feedback um, from students. And then interactive lecture demos. So um, again, teacher posing a scenario, students make predictions. So getting that kind of real-time feedback as it's being presented. Um, as I said earlier, I'm gonna show you this 
this is their, um, how you determine uh, the stimulation you want to use, what kind of stimulation. This is the different, um, you can do the remote, which is from home. You can do a lab, homework, multiple choice, discussion, demo, guided, or other. Um, any of the different simulations don't need to be used in that specific way, um, but I'll show you in a minute. Um, they've actually put together a kind of database for teachers so that they can see what other teachers are doing with those different um, simulations. You can go to your subjects here. You've got your mathematics there, physics. Um, a lot of the sciences, as it gets up higher, they use applied math. So um, although you might be teaching a concept in math, you might also find it in the physics section or the chemistry section. Uh, skill levels, so K to five, um, high school, middle school, um, graduate, intro, advanced, grad, other. Uh, you can have the different languages, which I also think is really incredible for those teachers teaching um, overseas. You can actually give students work in um, their uh, native language. So it helps with that kind of digital divide that's happening um, and it creates that um, ability for all students to learn using this tech. Um, so just to kind of go through, we'll go to physics and we'll go to graduate intro and go to English. So now we'll hit browse and it's going to come up with all of the different um, lessons that you could use for that grade level. Obviously I didn't choose um, a simulation. So there's tons and tons and tons of simulations. Um, but you could, you can then scroll through here, look for the concept that you're trying to teach, and then um, assign it to students through the URL link. So let's say I'm going with the Waves Intro Remote Lab. Um, I do have an account and I'm logged in, so that's why I have all these options. If you don't have an account, you won't have these Word documents. Um, so, but it is a free account. So once I click on this Wave Intro Remote Lab, I can then click on the document that it downloaded. It's a Word doc. Um, so you can either leave it as is or you can go through and edit the Word doc so that you can make it more applicable to whatever it is that you're teaching. Um, it takes you kind of through the steps, takes students through the steps of what they need to be doing, and then um, has the interactive component at the bottom where they're actually answering questions that apply to that lab. Uh, so for that reason, I really like this tech just because um, it has that support built in for people that maybe haven't used simulations before or that are kind of leery of stepping into that kind of realm of learning. Um, there's tons of support on here. The last thing I'm going to show you here is this teaching tab. Again, this, this connects to that support component. So you have the about, you have tips for using it. This one's really, really awesome. They've posted tons of videos about how they use or how they recommend, I guess, using the simulations. But they, they have a lot of PDFs here that show you, okay, how am I going to design an activity for the K to 12 classroom? How am I going to facilitate an activity for the K to 12 classroom? Um, how am I going to create an interactive lecture demonstration? So at the higher level. So they've really thought of a lot of ways to support teachers as they try to use this um, software. Um, so if I go back here to my slides, uh, I took a screen cap of the buoyancy one. I went through the other one, so it's no big deal, but um, tons of simulations on there for you to use. The one other thing um, is you can actually embed. So if you see down here, it says embed. So if you have um, a Wix or a Weebly or one of those other learning management systems, you can actually embed this simulation right onto your learning system so that um, students can interact with it right there. So Jeanette was showing you earlier the Ning. Um, if you decided that you wanted to embed this on there, it would keep them in that same area. So that connects back to that idea that Jeanette brought up earlier about um, keeping things organized and in one place and easy to find. Uh, easy to navigate, this connects to that component. So if you actually embed the uh, simulation onto your learning system, um, it's right there for the students to use and they don't have to go to another website and make another account. Uh, so another thing that I really like about, about that. Uh, so my time is almost up, so I'm going to hand it over. 
um, to Margie to talk to you guys about Desmos. Thanks, Laura. I'm just going to share my screen. And I'm going to hit here. I'm going to share my screen. Just one moment. And Laura, can you see my screen okay? Yep. Thanks. No worries. And I'm just going to present from here. Uh, so I am doing Desmo. So continuing on the theme of uh, online STEAM uh, instructional software or tools, um, Desmos is a um, software I particularly enjoy. Um, so I want to just talk about some of the uh, features of it, but really what Desmos does is it helps facilitate learning various math concepts. Um, and it has several different um, tools available, as well as classroom activities and um, the ability to make your own classroom activities with samples, etc. I'm going to walk you through some of those, but right now I just wanted to mention that it is free. So this is one of the things I love about it and it's very versatile. So it has multiple different options, um, both for some that are predefined classroom activities, um, as well as some exploratory tools like the graphing calculator and the geometry calculator, for example. And um, there's just like in um, FET, there's numerous teacher and student how-to videos um, available all on the Desmos uh, website. And this click, uh, this is actually a link to the Desmos website right here. Uh, but another feature I love about it is when you do do classroom activities, if you choose to do either a pre-formatted classroom activity or a uh, define your own or build your own, then you can um, see a dashboard, a teacher dashboard. So not only do the activities give automatic feedback to some of the students as they're going through it, but they also can give some uh, summer summaries to the teacher uh, of how the students are doing and how they're understanding some of the concepts. It's also available online as uh, an app on uh, mobile devices um, and as well as laptops and you can use it with your laptop desktop, but um, and it's compatible with both Windows and Apple. So uh, just to give you a, a brief summary, the Desmos uh, main uh, uh, sorry, website is right here. And as you can see there, it is a lot, uh, shows the compatibility here, shows the different options and um, some different examples here. So this is just the main website. I'm going to talk you through, so there are four main tools that they have available. One is the graphing calculator, which I'm going to show you, a scientific calculator. Um, so that is just like using a, a scientific calculator that you have, but it's online. There's a four function calculator, and then there's this awesome geometry tool, which has, helps you uh, or allows students to create, test, and explore lines, points, shapes, as well as geometric transformations, like a, a reflection, for example, or look at the line of symmetry. So a great interesting tool. All the links are here on the slide, as well as there are um, classroom activities here, as I mentioned, and the ability to create your own activities. So these classroom activities have already been created with graphs, with media, with activities, and with teacher, um, sorry, uh, assessment that, and feedback that is provided to the students as they go along, and there are teacher guides. So um, the two I'm going to go through today are the graphing calculator and the classroom activities. So the graphing calculator. Uh, so I created this little sort of animation video uh, right now. And what it does is um, what I find the two critical things that you can do with a graphing calculator is one, it can be used as an instructional tool. So you can use it to demonstrate um, graphing concepts, functions, equations, um, and you can also then animate some of these. You could also create it, take a video, 
uh, as we talked about with Screencastify, embedded into a presentation. And then additionally, you could actually share it with your students, uh, what you create. And then they could then take that graph and do even more discovery. So that's one of the things I love about it. It's the allows for students to really discover on their own and manipulate some equations, manipulate values, try different variables, and really discover some of the math concepts themselves. And one other feature that I particularly thought was very interesting was this concept of um, computational sketching. The link is here. So just to show you here uh, some of what the students have created, which are these fantastic pieces of art, but they're all with functions or equations. And so they've developed this artwork um, literally just with a bunch of different equations and artworks and points and variables. So very uh, interesting activities that can be done as well. Um, so these are just some of the concepts and functions that you can discover. Um, I, so deriv everything from derivatives to restrictions, regressions, I mean, and this is not the entire list as well, but um, what I've done here is uh, uh, if you click on this link here on the Desmos, um, it, and you go to this, it's called Learn Desmos Graphing, and it really does allow you to explore all of these different options if you need to see, if you want to see how to really effectively uh, present it or use it for your class. So, um, I want to now show you by going into the Desmos Graphing Calculator, I'm going to give you an overview of some of the features. I'm going to enter some functions and we're going to explore an, an animation and then I'm going to demonstrate some additional features, including the predefined options. So I'm going to click on this option right there. It's the Desmos uh, Graphing Calculator. So when you pull it up, it is a blank um, graph right here that appears and your cursor will appear here. As I mentioned, Desmos is free, so you can just click uh, create an account and agree right here, and then you can sign in with your Google account. And um, I'm going to click on mine here. And if you have any graphs that already exist, if you click on these three bars to the left, you can see anything that you have saved here on the left hand side. Um, you'll also notice that there are tons of examples. So there's lines, parabolas, there's trigonometry, uh, conic sections, uh, transformations, everything down to calculus, integrals, etc. So if you click on these and you wanted to see, you could actually open up this graph and you can continue on with uh, what they have created or you can um, modify it to meet your needs. So I'm going to just show you um, what you can add. So as you see here, it is just your uh, X and Y graph here on the right hand side. Um, uh, the plus sign here allows you to enter in different things. So you can enter in an expression. Um, if you want to enter in a note or a title uh, for certain things that you're, you're doing, that would be your note here with quotes. You can have a table. Um, a folder is used when you, let's say you have multiple different equations that you want to put in, but some need to be categorized in a certain, um, separately, you can create a folder for that. And then you can also uh, put in an image. So I'm going to start by just putting in a point here. So if you put in a point right away, let, or let's just say I put one and two. Now, the important thing is when you put in a point for, uh, to graph, you need to put in your brackets. And then as soon as I do that, you'll see on the right-hand side, I have my red point that appeared on the graph. If I click and hold on this red button, I could actually change the style. I can change the color. I could also make this drag option, either up or down, vertical, horizontal, or wherever I wanted to go, and then I could move that point to a specific location. Another option here is you could uh, add a table. So if you have a table of values, so if I wanted to 
say one and I'm going to square each of these. So go here, I'll just add a couple values here. If I was to enter down, you'll start to notice that if I just press enter, it automatically detects what my numbers will be. It doesn't do it on the next hand side because it's not sure what my, I am entering yet. Um, so let's say I put those values in for my X and Y. If I click on this purple dot icon here, you can see that I could actually create a line. So I have now have all these points and then it's going to create a line for me on the right hand side. I can change again, change the color of the line, etc. So different options you can do with your table values here. Um, now let's say I want to put in a uh, equation. So I'm going to put in the equation of a parabola. parabola. Now when I do this, I need to have 2x squared. So in order to do a square, I could either hold the shift, um, a, a shift key and go above 6, excuse me. You got to make sure your keyboard's not on French like mine is right now. And then it'll automatically bring you into the square function. But another option is you, this keyboard option at the bottom. So if I need to do any particular keys, a square root, uh, I want to put pi, um, x or y, I can uh, add it all from here. So I'll just put my x squared here. Um, let's say I'm going to add 4x and I'm going to minus 5. So now you can see on my right hand side I have my graph here and I can zoom in and out. I'm using my mouse key right now but I could also just press the minus or plus sign here just to take a better look. Immediately I have some points that appear any um, so between these two lines, if I, if there's a, if they intercept, then um, a point could appear. If I click on there, it'll automatically highlight this as a point. And if I was to add another line here, y is equal to 4x plus 2. Let's add, add a line here instead of a parabola. You can see that there's certain points that also highlight. So again, it, anything that intersects, it it intersect, intercepts, excuse me, it actually highlights it immediately and you can click it so that it appears. So it really helps facilitate certain points that you want to highlight. Um, I'm just gonna show you also a few other things. So if you go on the keyboard, again, at the bottom left, you'll see there's a bunch of different functions. So your trigonometry functions here, your statistical functions. So if you're teaching stats, you have a whole bunch here, as well as your distributions and various others. So all of these are available here. Um, I'm gonna show you now how to do an animation. So I'm gonna take off that equation. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove my table and I'm going to make my parabola, um, I want to show the trajectory of a basketball. So that's a parabolic curve, but it won't be in the same direction as this, it's upside down. So I'm going to put in a fraction here. So again, I could go into my keyboard and I could put one divided by 15 and that would make it uh, easy, easier to, uh, enter or I could um, put it on my keyboard doing 1 divided by 15. And then I'm going to say minus 10. Now right away you can see that I can't really see this on my screen so I can zoom out. Now if I want to do, I want to input an image, let's say I want to show a basketball moving along, I can actually upload an image by clicking the plus sign and hitting image. So I have a basketball that I've already saved here. So I want to upload that basketball. Now, right now, it immediately goes into this spot here. I can make it a little bit bigger. And you'll notice that I, it's centered at the point of zero, zero. So I can change this by adding a variable. And the moment that you add a variable here, it will add a slider. 
options. So because variables allow you to have um, different, um, they represent different values, um, it does allow that option. Now I want to make this travel along the curve. So I would need to make my equation into a function. And I'm going to just change my y value here for my basketball into f at a. So now you can see that the slider, as I move it along, it's actually going to move some of the distance. Now I can change the minimum value, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to make my basketball a little bit bigger. So in order to make your basketball bigger, you're just going to go like that. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to change my minimum value to, let's say, negative 50. And my maximum value will be, let's say, 100. And then what it does is it has this animation loop, if you see these two arrows. So this is a loop back and forth. I can change the speed, make it a little bit faster, or I could loop it in one direction. And then if I press play, it actually will then demonstrate the basketball animating along the loop. So it's just some of these different features that you can do. And then as an instructor, you could actually embed this into a video. Um, you could take a video as you are inputting different functions and equations and explaining them. Or what you can do is you could actually share this with your students after you've created it. And um, here you could either share a copy or embed it. And then students could then take this and explore even further, changing some of these uh, equations instead of negative 1 over 15. What if I change the values here and they can move through that? Or you could give them a list of questions by putting in a quote and asking them to do certain things. So you could explore um, the values in the equation. Whatever you want them to, to do, you could put it here and then share it. Just one, a uh, couple more things is you could actually put this into projector mode, which really makes this darker and uh, more clear. So that's through the graph settings here. And then additionally, there is the reverse contrast, as well as some accessibility features for, um, uh, it, this is accessible for those who are um, sight impaired or even hearing impaired. So there's the braille options here. And you can change certain features here for your grid. So that's a pretty much the graphing feature um, of Desmos. And I think it's one of the most versatile because it does allow for that discovery, but also as an introductory tool. Two more things I just want to quickly mention are the fact that there are classroom activities already um, developed in Desmos. And these are excellent because they're very engaging. They have uh, graphs, images, videos embedded, um, and a lot of applicability with real world concepts um, with, while learning the math concepts. Um, and then there's the teacher dashboards available and um, some uh, supportive facilitation options as well in terms of how to present this. So the great thing about Desmos is that the classroom activities can be do, done synchronously or asynchronously. And they, what I love about it is they provide automatic feedback to the students. Um, so it's not something you always have to go in, but you also do have the option of going in and connecting with your students and providing them feedback. And they can work on these classroom activities synchronously. So unlike the graphing, which I showed you, that does it, is not collaborative, but the classroom activities are. So in the slides, there are the information on how to set up a class, very simple. And also I have this slide here, which does talk about how you can create your own classroom activities. So I'll just to quickly show you, um, I'm not, I'm not going to go through these, but this link is available for you to explore. And it's, these are all the classroom activities that have already been created. And you can look at inequities, for example, and you can explore each one of these. And they tell you whether it's available on a mobile device, a tablet. It tells, gives you a teacher guide. So much like Laura had mentioned for FET, this also has a teacher guide. And as well as you can see the student preview. So what they will see, what kind of questions will be asked, 
but you could also modify these as well. And then of course, as I mentioned, you can create your own. So um, just wanted to give you that overview and, um, and there's more links here as well. And that is the end of my particular part. <laughs> Thanks, Margie.